and welcome to Epiphytic Cacti. Today we're going to take a look at Rupsalis Lindbergiana. Lindbergiana is not really that old of a Rupsalis species comparatively. It looks like it was described in 1995. And let's actually start this one out by reading the description from the New Cactus Lexicon by David Hunt. The body is pendant, less than four meters or more, forming a dense mass of closely adjacent branches. They are light green-gray to dark green. Branch segments arising subacrotonotically in groups of one to five, all of indeterminate growth and lacking a composite terminal area. And I want to pause for a second to explain what subacrotonotically means. So typically... What acrotonotic means is actually branches that will form from the very tip of the previous branches. Most Ripsalis do actually branch that way. This one, though, what it's saying is that new branches are forming above the apex of the old branches. So they don't typically form from the tip. The branch segments are between 60 and 90 centimeters long, which is extremely long. That is very, very long. And they are three to six, all the way up to 12 millimeters in diameter. So it sounds like there are some clones which, you know, potentially have like thinner, thinner branch segments and other clones which typically have thicker branch segments. So I don't want to confuse people because I think that this plant has been confused with a lot of other things. But just know that it can have thicker branches, but having thicker branches does not drastically alter the overall growth pattern. They are marked with spirals of minute scales. The aerials are apparent only after flowering with sparse wool and minute bristles. They flower laterally from irrumpent buds. The flowers are less than nine millimeters in diameter. The tepals or the petals, there are five to nine. This description has them being as greenish white. The stigma lobes are three to four. They're one millimeter long. The pericarpal, meaning the ovary of the flower bud, is green to reddish. The fruit is three to five by 2.5 to four millimeters. The berries or fruit are white or pink. Now that's a really interesting call out in this description because a lot of older descriptions for a lot of other Ripsalis won't really call that out. And because we don't have a lot of Ripsalis publications, a lot of up-to-date Ripsalis publications, a lot of times our descriptions are really only of the type. And the type may have had one color of berries while there's clone variation and you end up with other colors of berries. So it's nice that this one actually calls out the possibility of having white or pink berries. So there are later descriptions that I've read of this one too that call out the flower as possibly being different colors. And this is something that I've seen. And this of course makes sense. As we have covered before, there are the betalins, which can add the reddish pigments when you're dealing with cacti and where you would end up with some that might have pink berries, you might end up with a more pinkish flower. So I've seen pinkish flowers be called out in other de newer descriptions, but I've also seen where the flowers can be white. They can be white hinted with green. They can be white and green hinted with pink. They can be white and green hinted with yellow. They can be more of a yellowish color, kind of a goldish color actually tinted with pink, or they can really just look very kind of yellowish gold. So there's a lot of variation on the flowers here. And I do just wanna call that out because I think that that kind of, you know, helps create a lot of confusion when people are trying to identify some Ripsalis. On that note, let's go ahead and go to fieldguides.fieldmuseum.org. And let's look at the field guide Cactaceae of Rio de Janeiro. Now, first, we're going to take some time to look at Ripsalis grandiflora. The reason why we're going to look at Ripsalis grandiflora is because, unfortunately, Ripsalis grandiflora has been mislabeled as Ripsalis lindbergiana a lot in the United States. They really don't look alike. They really don't have the same growth pattern so I just kind of wanted to stop there and look at that. 
And then we can go ahead and look at Ripsalis Lindbergiana. Here we see it hanging in what has been described as large festoons from the trees. Here we see one that has kind of more goldish pinkish sort of flowers. On the right, we see one that is a little bit more pinkish. No doubt that one will end up with pink berries instead of white berries. Here's one that looks very similar to mine where it's more of like a goldish kind of pinkish color to the flowers. Here we see unripe green berries and you can kind of see because it's desiccated the segmenting in the branches or the ribs. There you see white berries. So that's kind of a look at some of the Ripsalis pictures from the field guide. Now we're gonna to go to another one of my favorite places. This is gbif.org. It's a really cool resource where you can just go look up whatever species that you want and you can find occurrences with pictures. These aren't always super accurate, but they're more accurate than, you know, most typical like just kind of websites. The reason why is because they're taking pictures of these in Brazil. They're generally locals that are taking pictures of these and locals would know their flora better than most other people. So the accuracy is higher, but it's not perfect. I, I've seen some issues with some of them where they're not actually, you know, tagged correctly. So just know that. But one of the other really great things about this, and we'll look at one at the very end, is that there are herbarium sheets from all over the place. So you can find herbarium sheets, which are invaluable in terms of determining identification for some species that have been so mixed up that it's it becomes very difficult. And one of the reasons why we're doing this is because in the United States, we had one nursery that was distributing Ripsalis grandiflora very widely as Ripsalis lindbergiana. And then we had another nursery who is still distributing Ripsalis lindbergiana as Lepismium lumbricoides. Now I did a Lepismium lumbricoides video. And the thing is, is while the plants may resemble each other, and they do, these plants do have kind of a strong resemblance to each other, the flowers do not. And I cannot stress enough that if you are even kind of confused about what your plant possibly is, wait for the flowers before trying to confirm identity and put a definite label on your plant. Do not just guess based off of what the plant looks like because these two plants, they are strikingly similar. Of course, Lepismium flowers and Ripsalis flowers are very different which is why, of course, they're in a different genus. Here I'm gonna go ahead and measure this plant and it's about 60 inches, which is about five feet, which is just under about two meters. So it, they get very, very long. Here we're looking at new growth on a different plant. And I think it's important to kind of look at this other plant that I have. They're both Ripsalis lindbergiana. It's just that one of them, because it's a little bit younger, it has somewhat of a different growth pattern here. So here we see a lot more of the subacronotic growth pattern happening. See how the branches are coming out of, I guess, the sides of the older branches and not so much the tips of the older branches. So you can see that this one really kind of hasn't hit that very, very long, long growth kind of stage just yet. Mainly, this is kind of what will happen when you have cuttings and you are rooting the cuttings and the cuttings have been damaged at the tips. It will present kind of a little bit of a different growth pattern. And that growth pattern is really why I think this was so prolifically mislabeled as Lepismium lumbricoides. Here, if we go ahead and we check the diameter of these branch segments, we're seeing that it's about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeters in diameter. So it's about half a centimeter in diameter. Now remember, these can get all the way up to being a centimeter in diameter. So, you know, some clones might be a little bit thicker, etc. Some might be a little bit thinner. And if we go back to my more mature plant here, you know, we can look at some of the growth pattern. And again, you know, we'll see that subacronotic growth branching sort of pattern here all over the place on this, making it really, really an interesting Ripsalis. This is actually truly one of my favorite Ripsalis because I just 
absolutely love when they they grow very 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 long like this and this one particularly can get some very monstrously long branches making it just absolutely gorgeous so here if we go ahead and we start looking at the flowers these are just wonderful wonderful little flowers and these flowers are a little bit more gold you can see that the flowers and this is a young, young plant. So these flowers are kind of sparse because it's the first time blooming, but these flowers will actually just go all up and down the branches, like huge, huge flowering all up and down the branches. You can see that these flowers are particularly a little bit more gold or a little bit more of like a goldish pinkish kind of color. The diameter of these flowers is, looks like it's about 0.8 centimeters or eight millimeters in diameter. So that perfectly fits in with the description. The length looks like it's also about 0.8 millimeters. If we go all the way to the end of the stigma lobes, you can see they're very small little flowers, but they're kind of cool. Like you can see they have a lot of petals. It's kind of very reminiscent of, I think, Ripsalis terrace form heteroclata flowers. Well, here you can see also the ovary or the pericarpal being kind of a green tinted with a little bit of pink, just the way that the description says. Here we see a little bud, and again you can see the pericarpal or ovary, same thing. So here let's take a look at another clone of Ripsalis Lindbergiana that I have. So I want to point out that this one presents is presenting a lot of aerial roots, and I do want to say that that is the same case for the other clone that I have growing in the background. Those two plants are actually the same clone. They're not different clones, they're the same clone. It's just that one I grew from more of like cuttings and the other one I actually picked up as a little bit more of a mature plant. So they do produce aerial roots, which is another reason why it may have been so prolifically mislabeled as Lepismium lumbricoides, because that is a trait that most people are used to Lepismium lumbricoides presenting. So when a Ripsalis presents that, people get confused, but Ripsalis can quite commonly present aerial roots just depending on growing conditions. You know, high humidity can produce an abundance of aerial roots, actually like a lack of water, a lack of light. So there are a lot of reasons why they might do that. In terms of the prolific mislabeling, you know, I've, I've actually tried to find paths of reaching out to these commercial nurseries to try to get some of the plants that they're selling, some of the epiphytic cacti labeled correctly. I have not had any success whatsoever with that thus far. Using Google as a resource to just type in the name of your plant, Google, you know, Googling it, looking at pictures and identifying your plant that way is actually not a very good idea when it comes to epiphytic cacti. Um, they're already so prolifically mislabeled that so many of the pictures are totally incorrect. You can see this when you just go Google some of them that you'll come up with tons of different pictures where they're all wildly different. It's also dangerous to read botanical descriptions and take things out of context. You know, taking something out of context, like it has white berries. I think that's how we got into so much danger when it came to the mislabeling of Ripsalis sulcata in the United States. I also think completely ignoring the botanical description is a mistake. Always make sure that whatever species you have fits the actual botanical description. The white berry thing, that being taken out of context in the description instead of using the whole botanical description. I also think that going to places like Facebook or communities or forums or whatever, you know, and posting your Ripsalis and saying, hey, what is this? and having, you know, nine different people give you nine different IDs for it, it's also probably not that good. So I'm going to say that you should probably always, you know, you can take the suggestions that you're getting, but always wait until that plant blooms. There are some Ripsalis that you can just ID the plant on site. That is true. Some of them are so unique that you can just look at it and know exactly what it is just by how it's growing. But a large portion of them, that is just not true. And in the meantime, I will keep chugging along with these videos and I will keep doing deep dives and deep research to try to figure out, you know, the correct IDs for a lot of these Ripsalis. Some of the Ripsalis I have, I still don't know what they are. 
You know, in any case, I, I hope that you keep on chugging along with me. I hope that you've enjoyed looking at Rufsalis Lindberghiana with me. Thank you for watching, and as always, happy cacti growing.